This audio presentation was pre recorded and edited for brevity and clarity. Hello, my name is Diana Campbell, and I'm pleased to be here with you for today's macular degeneration chat new option for anti VEGF treatment for wet AMD. This chat is brought to you today by Bright Focus Foundation. Macular degeneration research is one of our programs here at Bright Focus. We fund exceptional scientific research worldwide to defeat Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, and glaucoma, and we provide expert information on these heartbreaking diseases. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's guest, Dr. Lloyd Clark, who will discuss a new anti-VEGF treatment option that is available for wet AMD or macular degeneration. We will refer to macular degeneration as AMD um, throughout the call. Dr. Clark specializes in the treatment of vitreous and retinal diseases. He is also dedicated to the advancement of new treatments for retinal diseases through his involvement with clinical trials for the newest therapies for age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and retinal vein occlusion. Dr. Clark, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. What a great group. Thanks so much. So last month, our chat was all about dry macular degeneration and geographic atrophy. Today, we'll be discussing another type of macular degeneration, or wet AMD. Dr. Clark, can you start us out with a description of what wet, what wet AMD is? Sure, absolutely. So age-related macular degeneration in general is a very, very common condition, most common cause of vision loss in, in Americans over the age of 60, and is um, that with diabetes are the number one and number two causes of uh, severe vision loss in the United States. Now, the good news is, is about 80% of people with age-related macular degeneration only have the dry form, and it starts as the dry form, and it sounds like this group talked about dry macular degeneration uh, during your last session, but in short, dry macular degeneration is when you develop pigmentary changes in the retina, most of the time mild to moderate vision loss unless a patient develops geographic atrophy. Now, of those patients, approximately 20% of patients with macular degeneration at some point in their life will develop wet macular degeneration in at least one eye. Um, not both eyes necessarily, but at least one eye. And wet macular degeneration is caused by an abnormal blood vessel that grows underneath the retina. It's, if you sort of think about it like a wound healing response, it's a response to the structural damage caused by dry macular degeneration. And this abnormal blood vessel grows under the retina. And these abnormal blood vessels leak fluid, they bleed, they do all kinds of bad things that can uh, damage vision much more rapidly than dry macular degeneration. So patients, once they develop an abnormal blood vessel under the retina, can develop fairly rapid um, deterioration of vision and sometimes acute vision loss with certain complications of this abnormal blood vessel. Thank you, that made it very clear. Um, so we're fortunate that the first treatments, um, or the first treatment for wet AMD was developed more than 15 years ago. Uh, could you touch on the existing treatment landscape to date for wet AMD before we move um, into ILEA HD specifically? Sure. So prior to, to 2006, we really didn't have meaningful therapies for wet AMD. In 2006, we had our first drug approved by the FDA for the treatment of wet AMD. It's a drug called ranibizumab or Lucentis. It, is, uh, it, it blocks a, a pathologic protein called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. And so this really was a revolutionary drug. For the first time, we were able to uh, improve vision uh, with wet macular degeneration, uh, prior to which we, we had no treatments that were available to improve vision. Now, since that time, we've had a number of different agents uh, that were approved by the FDA in that same class that, that bind and, and uh and inhibit the activity of VEGF. Uh, ILEA or Aflibercept was the next. And now we have a number, three or four, that are available, and different clinicians use different drugs in this same treatment class. Uh, this has been a, a, an incredible advancement in the management of patients with macular degeneration. More recently, we've had some novel therapies. Uh, prior, to, in, in addition to what we're talking about today, which is ILEA HD, we've had some other fairly new therapies uh, available. We have our first drug that targets a second molecular uh, pathway, a drug called Vibismo. And also we're beginning to see uh, novel strategies for the treatment of wet macular degeneration. There's now a surgical device that can be implanted in the eye 
um, that you can put uh, ranibizumab in that may last up to six months. But the mainstay of treatment for wet macular degeneration uh, in 2022 and before is uh, treatment with vascular endothelial growth factor uh, antagonists, these drugs, these biologics injected in the eye. Great, thank you. So over the summer, uh, the FDA approved a new higher dose of ILEA called ILEA HD 8 milligrams. Uh, could you please talk a little bit about the data from the clinical trials um, leading up to this approval and how this new version of ILEA differs from the standard um, 2 milligram formulation that so many are already familiar with? Right. So one of the great things about ILEA HD is that it's uh, just a different formulation of a drug that has been a tried and true uh, therapeutic option for us for close to 15 years. Two milligrams ILEA has really become the gold standard in clinical practice. It's also the gold standard in clinical research trials. So any clinical trial that's done to evaluate a new therapy for macular degeneration today is compared against two milligram ILEA. And so thinking about the current landscape, two milligram ILEA is the gold standard for treatment of retinal diseases, and including macular degeneration. Uh, building on that, ILEA HD is really nothing other than the same molecule, the aflibercept molecules uh, supplied in an eight milligram dose. The dose is more concentrated, but there's also a slightly higher volume delivered in the eye. What did we see in clinical trials with the eight milligram dose? Well, we saw uh, two important uh, uh, clinical, um, uh, well, really three important clinical signs that this is a, an excellent new option. The first is that visual outcomes with reduced uh, treatment burdens demonstrated similar visual acuity outcomes. Patients saw the same or better with ILEA HD compared to two milligrams of Flibercep. So we're not giving up any uh, improvements in visual acuity by utilizing the new therapy. The new therapy, though, is designed to be used much less frequently. And so in the clinical trials evaluating a Flibercept 8 milligram or a ILEA HD, there was no monthly group. So many of you that are getting injections for macular degeneration start out with monthly injections, and many patients continue on monthly injections for extended period of time. This drug was not studied past past three initial injections for monthly therapy. Patients uh, immediately went out to eight-week therapy and could it be extended as infrequently as every 16 weeks. So keep in mind, 16, that's three injections per year. And many, many patients were managed very, very well um, after that initial loading phase with, with increasing uh, treatment intervals past four or eight weeks. So the second important findings is that we were able to extend treatment intervals substantially longer than what's been previously shown with single agent anti-VEGF drugs. And then finally, the other uh, encouraging piece is that looking at patients during the early course of therapy, this drug appears to have a better capability of drying the retina, of inactivating the disease. And so it appears to have a, a higher potency than the two milligram dose, particularly early in the course of treatment. And we, as, as uh, clinicians, feel like one of the more important things to do for our patients is to get this under control quickly. So in summary, the drug works just as well as our gold standard, using it much less frequently and has a higher potency. So it has a, a number of potential advantages for what we currently have. Oh, that's a, that's a huge benefit to be able to extend out that far um, when people are, are starting with, um, you know, potentially starting with eight, the 8 milligram formulation, uh, do they start with, um, what, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to get at is the frequency when they start. So do they, do they start at 8 weeks or how does that rollout look um, that might eventually right. lead them to 15 weeks? Well, we're still learning in terms of, you know, it's interesting. Um, these, the, all these drugs have uh, labeled dosing strategies that are, that are in the FDA-approved label, and we as doctors sometimes monkey with that schedule. I think that schedule will be sort of modified a little less um, than the previous generation drugs because it's a, a fairly prescriptive label. The way the, the drug is currently labeled for wet, for wet macular degeneration treatment is the patient's treated monthly for three months and then extended at least out to eight weeks after the initial three doses. So what I would anticipate 
most patients that are started on ILEA HD will get three monthly injections by their doctor and then extend out to eight weeks from there, evaluate the patient in terms of clinical response, and then based on um, experience or review of the clinical trial data, it, many patients will be able to, to be extended out as far as every 16 weeks uh, in the chronic treatment phase. Great. That's really exciting news for, for folks who are used to going to the office on sometimes every month. Um, so for people who have just been recently diagnosed with wet AMD, um, do they need to have a, an existing treatment history with an anti-VEGF treatment in order to switch over, or can they be started on this as a first line of treatment? Well, you can do either, um, and that's one of the really um, exciting things about ILEA HT. Obviously, the, the clinical trial data was, um, was all done with what we call treatment-naive patients, patients with a new diagnosis of wet AMD had not been uh, treated with any previous drugs for wet AMD. So the trial data that we discussed in, in, in here and in other settings is all based on patients with a new diagnosis of wet AMD. But another very exciting group of patients are patients that are on chronic therapy today. So many, many patients, you know, this, this disease in general is not, uh, you can't cure wet macular degeneration. Most patients stay on injections for a chronic period of time, perhaps for life. And many, many of these patients stay on or end up on ILEA, and they end up on ILEA at some dosing regimen um, between four and 12 weeks. When, we, when you understand how eight milligram works in the eye, it gives you a mathematical advantage of about four to five weeks. So another really exciting uh, uh, opportunity here with ILEA HD is to take, let's say, a, for example, a patient that's currently on chronic uh, ILEA injections every eight weeks and their disease is under good control. Well, mathematically, you should be able to take that eight-week patient and get them to at least 12 weeks with ILEA HD, if not possibly longer. So, the, it, so clearly, this is a great treatment option for treatment-naive patients. It's also a very, very good option for stable patients that want to reduce their treatment burden. Great. Um... Let's see. Um, are there any significant side effects or anything that folks should know as they're making this decision related to, um, to side effects? I imagine they're probably similar to the two milligram formulation. Right. So, you know, we have now, you know, 15 years, uh, close to 20 years of experience in clinical trials about um, giving anti-VEGF agents for a variety of retinal diseases. The good news is that this class of agent um, uh, appears to be safe given as an intravitreal injection. We were worried about these VEGF inhibitors when we started using them in, in clinical trials because the first VEGF inhibitors were used to treat cancer. And the cancer doses, the doses used to treat cancer were 500 times the dose of what's given in the eye. And in these patients with end-stage solid tumors, there was an increased risk of heart attack and stroke in the clinical trials. And so we were concerned, very concerned early on uh, if we might um, in introduce an increased risk of cardiovascular events in this otherwise, you know, fairly healthy patient population. As it turns out, these small doses in the eye do not uh, increase the risk of heart attack and stroke, even the 8-milligram dose. So the, the agent... Is a, is a safe agent. The main risk associated with giving these these treatments is the is the way it's delivered as an intravitreal injection. So people can get there, there is a risk of retinal detachment if the needle hits the wrong thing. There's a risk of an infection if the if the drug or the needle is contaminated. Certainly, patients that have gotten injections are familiar with developing pain after the injection, either due to irritation from the betadine or a corneal abrasion. So there's a number of things that can occur, but they are typically all related to the procedure itself. And so the drug choice is somewhat independent of the risk profile. Great. Um, so you, you've, you've essentially already answered this, but I just want to ask it again this way to kind of call it out and clarify it. So if an individual is currently taking a different anti-VEGF treatment, and we did have somebody specifically mention Avastin, um, they can switch to ILEA HD, and it sounds like what you're saying is there aren't, there's not a different safety profile. There, there aren't necessarily safety concerns that they would need to be aware of if they're switching from one anti-VEGF 
over to ILEA HD. Is that um, is that correct? Well, in the case of Avastin, I think there's a there's a couple of uh, specific issues. I, my comments were more generally directed towards the FDA approved agents. In terms of Avastin, there's a couple of other things to at least consider. The first is um, to understand that when we give patients Avastin, uh, Avastin is compounded at a at a at an outside facility. So when we get uh, ILEA HD or Lucentis or Babisma or any of these FDA approved agents, the the drug comes sealed in a sterile vial from the manufacturer. When we get Avastin uh, for wet macular degeneration treatment, we receive it in repackaged tuberculin syringes that we get from a, a compounding pharmacy. And so there's a sort of a, the way I, the, the term I use is a break in the chain of custody. There's an extra step in processing with Avastin. And there is some theoretical concern that you may introduce contamination. So to me, there is a little bit of an increased risk of using Avastin in terms of contamination relative to the uh, FDA approved drugs. The second issue specifically related to Avastin, though, is, is efficacy. You know, certainly Avastin has been a tremendous benefit uh, to the treatment of retinal disease, but in specifically age-related macular degeneration, the only clinical trials that we've got that support the use of Avastin is a trial called the CAT study, which was paid for by your tax money that compared one of the approved drugs and Avastin. And Avastin performed very well in the CAT study, and it was demonstrated equivalent to Lucentis as long as it was used monthly, right? So the trouble with Avastin, when you look at clinical trial data, is that Avastin is an inferior drug if it's used less than every four weeks. So when you compare, you know, a drug like ILEA HD where the majority of patients can be extended to 12, really 75% of people can go out past 12 weeks, and you compare that to Avastin, where it's an inferior drug uh, if it's not used 12 times a year, there's a, there's a significant benefit um, in terms of um, the idea of treatment burden and also the incremental risk of, of treatment. You know, each injection has an incremental risk. When we talked about the main issues um, related to the complications, the complications occur every time you get an injection. So if you get three injections a year with ILEA HD, and you get 12 injections a year of Avastin, you have four times the, the risk of a complication because you're getting that many more procedures. So there's a number of, Avastin is a wonderful option for many people, but it does have some limitations. Oh no, that was an excellent description um, of, you know, of the comparing and contrasting of Avastin and the slightly different safety profile. That's um, outstanding, thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I realize you may not have the answer to this right now. I'll still ask. Um, the first part of the question is, um, is this already re readily available in doctor's offices? And then the follow-up to that is regarding coverage. And I know with approvals, sometimes um, Medicare specifically, specifically tends to lag, you know, six months or so behind, um, behind that decision. Um, but is it readily available? And is there any comment you'd like to make regarding coverage? Sure. Well, and uh, the the basic the, the simple answer is yes. It is available. It is available from distributors. Um, we do have ILEA HD in our office. I have used um, it um, commercially on a number of patients um, already. Now that being said, there is there are a number of headwinds during the first six months or so. You described described it well. There's sort of a, there are a number of headwinds. Um, in terms of adoption of early uh, treatments, particularly in the first six months after a drug is approved by the FDA. The first is payers, it takes a little bit of time for payers to get comfortable um, with a new, uh, a new agent. Um, you know, Medicare oftentimes, straight Medicare actually oftentimes does better than many of the commercial payers. The commercial payers tend to go a little bit slower, but the other issue that affects um, uh, availability is this is a is a, the 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 availability of a billing code. This is really sort of getting in the weeds in terms of practice management. But we utilize what's called a J code. A J code is a billing code that we use to bill Medicare and 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 commercial insurance companies for drugs. And whenever a drug is approved by the FDA, um, it's that it, it, there is a temporary J code and a permanent J code 
the temporary J code is, is issued at the time of FDA approval, but the temporary J code is very difficult for many payers to manage. And so our experience is that it's much easier for drugs to be reimbursed once the permanent J code is in place. And that typically takes about six months. So that's that's really the the main structural issue which affects immediate access to drugs is really, you know, sort of a procedural um, issue. But I would say um, uh, large, large numbers of retina practices around the country are already ordering ILEA HD and are already using it. Um, and it's and it's um, certainly an exciting option. That's great, um, and I think you know certainly folks can um, can talk with their own doctors um, to see if it's available or when it when it will be available. Um, and again, um, if you don't have the answer to this this next question, which is a follow up, um, perfectly fine. Um, but overall, with the treatment, is there a significant cost difference over with the eight milligram formulation over, let's say, the two milligram formulation? Um, I, you know, I think, the, yeah, I, yeah, the, the, the eight milligram dose is a little more expensive than the two milligram. Makes sense. It's four times the amount of drug in the eye. It's also, um, it gives the opportunity for reduced treatment burden. If you can take, you know, like if you go do an apples to apples comparison, and what I mean by that is eight milligrams gives you what are, what what's called three half lives more of the drug, and the half life's about twelve days. So. Theoretically, you should get 36 more days out of an 8 milligram dose compared to a 2 milligram dose. Well, if you apply that over a year's period of time, the actual cost of drug with the 8 milligram is less than the 2 milligram, but the individual dose is is uh, is more expensive. Um, so, it, how that plays out in terms of you know the medical economics is a, is a challenging one. You know, there's the issues related to what it costs the 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 insurance company, the out-of-pocket costs. I would say that in terms of the patient, all the um, patient support programs that are currently in place for ILEA 2 milligram are, in, are available for ILEA 8 milligram as well. So I, I think that patients are more like are, are just as likely to get help in situations where they need it, and due to the reduced number of uh, in, injections likely needed, they're more likely not to run out of things like foundation assistance for patients that, that need assistance. That's a really important um, thing to mention. Thank you for, for bringing that in. Um, are there questions that you receive from your patients um, who are interested uh, in this treatment? What are the types of things you're hearing kind of on the ground? Or are there questions that you would suggest that folks um, ask their, their own doctors after this call if they're considering, um, you know, potentially asking to switch to this treatment? Yeah, so I mean, I think the first issue is that this is a pretty easy conversation with patients that are already on ILEA. Um, you know, if you, you talk to a patient about some other agent, you know, we've had other agents come along that appear to be either um, the same or slightly better, but they have a different mechanism of action. And so there's some uncertainty as to whether or not you're actually going to improve treatment burden in that case. In the case of ILEA HD, it's again, it's the same molecule. There's, there's, you, you, you would, you would believe, and it would be, it would make sense that a patient's response to eight milligram in terms of disease uh, activity would be similar to the two milligram, and the only difference is that the drug would last longer. Um, he, um, uh, you know, so I, I, it's a pretty easy conversation with patients that are already on ILEA. The idea of switching and and uh, reducing treatment burden, increasing intervals. You know, in terms of treatment naive patients, um, you know, ILEA 2 milligram has been the standard of care now and, and is by far the most widely used VEGF agent has been that way for a number of years. And so when we take a drug that's been compared in head to head in clinical trials and is shown to have a better drying effect with reduced treatment intervals, um, again, it's a very easy conversation. If you're considering putting a patient on 2 milligram ILEA, then it makes a lot of sense that eight eight milligram ILEA is a very very um, uh, interesting choice as well. 
Great. That's wonderful news. Um, so I'm going to pivot at this point um, to some of the questions that we've received over the course of the call and a couple that we've received um, prior um, to, the, to the when we started the call today, um, all about what AMD. Well, the first one is a good segue, um, and I don't actually know the answer to this yet. Um, is ILEA HD also good for retinal vein occlusion or RVO? Um, I know frequently other indications are, um, you know, are eventually – uh, submitted and approved um, for approval by the FDA. Is this something that's in place already, or is this something that um, might happen in the future? So, ILEA HD is already approved for age related macular degeneration, diabetic macular edema, and diabetic retinopathy, so any type of diabetic eye disease. Um, it is not approved by retinal, for retinal vein occlusion currently. Typically, um, the companies that develop um, these drugs for us in the retina space. space um, address age-related macular degeneration and diabetic macular edema first because there's so much these these diseases are so much more common than any other uh, disease state in our practices now that being said um, retinal vein occlusion is an incredibly attractive target for VEGF inhibition the the target protein ba vascular endothelial growth factor has very very high levels in these diseased eyes with retinal vein occlusion and so what we've seen with the first generation VEGF inhibitors is a dramatic and profound improvement uh, with even a single injection of ILEA 2 milligram. So it would make sense that 8 milligram is going to be an incredibly effective choice for patients with retinal vein occlusion. The clinical trials are currently being enrolled. Um, those trials are relatively short. The primary endpoint with retinal vein occlusion trials is 24 weeks or six months. So we anticipate that ILEA HD will be approved by the FDA probably in the 12 to 18 month window for retinal vein occlusion. Oh, that's wonderful news. Um, this one is actually still kind of related to the one of the previous questions I asked you. Um, given that um, Vibismo addresses the two pathways, are there additional um, questions that should be asked um, or considerations that one should make? Um, you know, it, when considering perhaps um, exploring use of um, ILEA eight milligrams, um, or you know, do you have, do you have thoughts on that? That um, that those particular patients that are now on a slightly different treatment um, might consider. Well, I, let me answer that. The um, that's a let me answer it this way. Um, the, the the patient that you, you that you may be a little bit concerned about switching to ILEA HD is a patient that's on. A monthly ILEA 2 milligram and still has active disease. And that is uncommon, but it does occur where a patient, despite the most aggressive therapy currently available with 2 milligram ILEA, they still have active disease. That is a patient that it makes sense to try an agent that has dual action. So that to me is a patient that's very, a very attractive patient to do a treatment trial with Vibismo. It may be that the ANG2 inhibition, the other pathway, may offer that patient an, an additional benefit. So um, that's one group of patients where I would consider utilizing a dual action drug prior to um, switching to uh, ILEA HD. Um, in terms of a patient that's on Vibismo going to ILEA HD, um, you know, it's certainly possible that they'll have a very, very similar clinical response. One of the uh, one of the issues, one of the uh, the characteristics that's not discussed much about Vibismo is that yes, it does have the second pathway, the ANG2 inhibition, which basically um, helps stabilize blood vessel complexes. But Vibismo also has an increased concentration of VEGF inhibition as well, somewhere roughly between ILEA 2 milligram and ILEA 8 milligram. So Vibismo is kind of covering both. Um, both areas. It does offer a second uh, pathway, but it also gives you a little more VEGF uh, inhibition. I mean, yes, VEGF inhibition. So, you know, I, one of the problems switching from ILEA to Vibismo is you, you didn't really know exactly what you were going to get because the, the drugs are different enough that I think sometimes the, 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 the clinical response was a little bit unpredictable. And I would say the same might be true going from, from Vibismo to 8 milligrams. Many patients may do well, but it's difficult to predict because the mechanisms are different. What I will say is a patient that's stable on ILEA 2 milligrams should be very comfortable going to 8 milligram 
and clinical trial data um, looking at the efficacy and treatment naive patients makes eight milligram a great choice. Great, and just to repeat um, what we said at the at the top, treatment naive means that they're starting treatment um, for the very first time, so they're not making a switch. That's right. Um, they're they're at That's onset of disease. Okay, great. New diagnosis. Um, New diagnosis. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> This is a question that came in specifically about ILEA HD, but we actually already had somebody else ask um, a similar question um, that I think can be kind of extrapolated to anti-VEGF, although you're the expert and <laughs> you can tell me, um, does ILEA HD or, you know, to broaden it, other anti-VEGF treatments help improve vision in addition to stopping the bleeding? What is the clinical Oh, without experience? a doubt. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, so the reason... Yeah, so the reason why these drugs were such a – so the, let's go back to 2006 with um, Lucentis and 2009 with ILEA. The reason why these drugs were so revolutionary is that on average patients gain between 8 and 10 letters with uh, monthly therapy with these drugs. Um, uh, and that's why the, the difference between that and the current standard of care was dramatic. So on average, with even the first-generation drugs, we expect somewhere around a two-line – improvement of visual acuity on the eye chart, eight to 10 letters. Um, so that's, a, that, that's a, a completely different expectation than we had prior to 2006. In terms of uh, the newer, the next generation drugs like ILEA HD, you know, the visual acuity improvements are the same. Um, so far, we really have not identified any new agent that does a better job at improving vision than ILEA 2 milligram, uh, but the difference is, is that these next generation drugs we can give much less frequently on average. Which is so important, um, you know, for, for patient satisfaction and lifestyle and ability to have the freedom to, to do the things that they'd love to do. Right. Um, and and, and to one more comment about that, you know, we've got long-term data on patients treated with Avastin for five years that were treated less frequently than monthly, you know, treated on a treatment schedule similar to what we're talking about here. And after five years, all their visual acuity gains were lost, right? So that, that gives you a sense of, you know, Avastin has its role, but as a drug that, that can offer long-term consistent improvement, improvement of vision, Avastin is not very good at doing that. Thank you for mentioning that. I think that's, you know, the longer-term benefit. You know, certainly people are looking to have an injection and be able to see, you know, that, that marked improvement. Um, but certainly that longer-term efficacy or, you know, ability to, um, to keep things at bay is, is equally important, um, especially once people have gotten adjusted to the fact that they're using injections and are more familiar with, you know, the whole, the whole landscape and the whole treatment process. Um, similar to that question, um, with with longer term anti VEGF treatment. So for people that have been on on treatment for a while, um, we've we've had people ask, or we've had people with um, you know a report back from their doctor that their eyes are dry, um, or they they don't need an injection on that particular visit at least. Can wet AMD be totally changed to dry AM, back to dry AMD, or can it dry out to the point where folks may not need ongoing treatment? I mean, this is a this is kind of an issue of semantics a little bit. I would say, from my perspective, once you develop wet macular degeneration, you always have wet macular degeneration. Now, you may have inactive wet macular degeneration, and I think that's the difference. Some people may say it's it's turned dry, but to me. When I think about it, an eye, if it develops wet macular degeneration, then you've then you've you've got it for life. The question is whether you can come off of treatment. Um, you know, I think that's an area of still somewhat controversy in the retina in the in in the field of management of retinal disease. Um, the best data suggests that only about 30% of eyes can safely come off of treatment for life. So that means what you would expect is if you stop therapy, you've got a 30% chance you'll never need an injection again, but you have a 70% chance that you will. It's difficult, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to predict what a recurrence can look like. Sometimes they can be very mild. Sometimes they can be quite severe. Um, so there's really sort of two schools of thought, I'd say largely, 
among, you know, thoughtful retina doctors. Many retina doctors give patients a chance to come off treatment because patients want to stop injections, and I totally get that. For me, I, 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 particularly in patients that have a good outcome, I'm very reluctant to stop therapy. What I'm more likely to do is to leave patients on a um, maintenance dose, which is like, for instance, with 2 milligram ILEA, you know, I've got just dozens and dozens of patients in my practice to get four injections a year, what would amount to sort of an insurance policy. You know, with 8 milligram, that number should go to three times a year. And, and, you know, you're going to be seeing them two or three times a year, even if you're not giving them injections. And the idea of giving them a shot as an insurance policy against any recurrence, I'm not trying to minimize the, the, you know, the discomfort and the anxiety and the, and the non-fun factor of an injection. But, you know, my job is to think about the long term, 5, 10, 15 years from now. And, and I, I, these drugs are incredibly effective, and, and I've seen too many recurrences. Um, to not take them very seriously. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And I think, you know, and, and you essentially said this, but if folks are, you know, taking a pause on treatment for whatever reason, maintaining that appointment schedule and still seeing their um, their retina specialist is, I think, of utmost importance so that if any changes are occurring that they're not noting at home, that can be addressed um, immediately so that further vision loss is not um you know, does not occur. <clears throat> um, this is a this is a newer question. We haven't had to ask this question very many times. Um, but given that, you know, um, over the course of the past, you know, six months um, or so, there is now um, injection, you know, approved injection therapy as well for geographic atrophy. Um, many folks that might have both wet AMD and geographic atrophy, you know, who are who are trying to figure out what they're going to do and if they're going to be getting these injections for dry AMD, um, what does that look like? Um, do that, you know, is it recommended to alternate um, months or do you have any comment? And it, and if you don't, that's fine. No. But do you have any comment on kind of incorporating, um, you know, an additional injection therapy for a different form of AMD? for people that have kind of already been on, you know, or may have onset of wet AMD. It's yeah, a lot of it's tough. In the eye. <laughs> yeah, boy, it's a lot of injections. Um, you know, I, the, what, the, I, you know, I have a, a handful of people that are getting treatment for concurrently for dry AMD and wet AMD. Most people that I've talked to about it are not particularly excited about it. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is that treatment for wet macular degeneration is mandatory. Treatment for dry macular degeneration is what largely optional at this point. You know, I, we're really excited about the dry AMD treatments, but the reality is, you know, they're not particularly effective when you compare them to groundbreaking therapies like anti-VEGF agents for wet AMD. You know, we're talking about a 20% reduction in the growth of, of uh, geographic atrophy lesions. It's very difficult to measure treatment response. Um, and it's a treatment that has to be continued forever. So, I mean, I, I think where we are is we're at the very, very beginning of dry AMD therapy. I think it gives patients hope, and I think that it's certainly worth doing in highly motivated patients. Now, um, when you add on wet macular degeneration treatment, it is a daunting prospect to get two injections every six to eight weeks forever um, because you know, you can't, you really do have to spend a little more time and be a little more thoughtful because the volume of, of the, of Cyphobri in particular, you know, is, is enough that you can't just give these injections back to back. You've got to either, um, you, you've got to take some time in the office. So these are very long drawn out, uh, visits and, and, uh, and it's difficult. So, um, I mean, I applaud people for being motivated to do both. But what I have had, the conversation that I've had more than once is, you know, patient goes, well, I, I just can't do both of these. Which one should I do? And the answer is, again, anti-VEGF therapy is mandatory. And at this point, if that's the question, then the GA treatment is optional. I think I know the answer to this question, um, and I'm fairly certain that somebody will ask it if they haven't already. I'm assuming that you cannot get both injections on the same day, especially if it's in the oh. same eye. <laughs> oh, sure you can. Yeah, you know, you can. Okay. There's a couple okay. things. Good. Yeah, you, 
Yeah, there's a couple of ways to manage that. The easiest way to manage that actually is to give it is to use a third needle, and some people do this, where you actually take a little fluid out of the eye to start with, and then give an injection, and then get another injection. So that's actually three procedures in one eye in one day. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun, does it? Um, but that's that's a way to do it. I mean, then the other way is. You know, the way I do it when I do it on the same day is I'll typically give the anti-VEGF agent first because it's a smaller volume and then let the pressure re-equilibrate. The issue with getting both injections on the same day is pressure. The eye can't really tolerate um, the amount of volume that, from a dry and a wet AMD injection at the same time. You, you'd run the risk of, of causing an artery occlusion because the pressure in the eye would be so high. So you have to wait. You can do it, but you just have to wait between the two. Okay, and there's no, you know, with, with this being so new, there's 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 nothing yet where you can do them all, you know, with one needle. Um, so it is a, a longer day at the office, and um, you know, time weighted in between. Um, I'm glad I'm glad I asked that though, because I, I I kind of guessed <laughs> in my um, unexpert mind that um, that might not be possible. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, two more that are kind of more broad, uh, the wet AMD experience. Um, do, what is, is there a forecast or how long um, on average, if we know this, will the, you know, what's the lifetime value of injection? You know, is there is there a time when they won't work anymore? Um, and then this person in particular had some shadows and spots moving in their eye and we're wondering if it was kind of related to that. So is that a common experience? And is there, you know, kind of a anticipated time frame where they, they may not, you know, work as well anymore in the life cycle of the disease? Um, to, to get to your first question, your, your second question first, if, if you've got new visual symptoms and you're being treated for wet macular degeneration, you really need to go in and get them evaluated. It's very difficult um, to interpret changes you know, any type of vision symptoms in that setting over the phone. So, you know, I mean, I think if you're seeing new spots or new areas of distortion, that's a reason to call your doctor and that's a reason to come in and be evaluated. Um, you know, there are technologies that work hopefully in the future that may help manage that at home. In particular, there's one thing I'm really excited about is there's a company that's developing a home version of the OCT. For, you, for those of you getting injections, you get that that scan of your eye every time. Well, there's a company building one that you could have in your house, which I think is very exciting because you'd be able, we would be able to see the results at home and you might not have to come in. But short of that today, you need to come in if you've got vision symptoms. Now, in terms of long-term treatment, I'll give you two answers. The, the short answer is um, thoughtful, aggressive treatment can maintain vision for long, long periods of time. And I'll give you two examples of that as we wrap up. The first is a clinical trial, a trial called the FIDO study. A good friend of mine in Tampa, Florida, has followed a group of patients. He does something different than many of us. He, you know, we all thought that we were smart by limiting the number of injections. And he said, you know, this clinical trial data is pretty exciting. So I'm going to treat patients every four to six weeks forever because that seems to be the best thing to do. And he now has 15-year data on a group of patients that have been treated long-term aggressively with injections for macular degeneration. And on average, they're all seeing better than they were at the time of diagnosis after 15 years. And so that is a great endorsement for the idea that aggressive therapy works and aggressive therapy works for the long time. A second example I'll give you is, a, is an anecdotal patient of mine. Um, one of the first patients that I ever enrolled in a clinical trial, I enrolled her in a Lucentis clinical trial in 2003, and she had already lost vision in her first eye from macular degeneration. And she died in, in 2021, 18 years after um, enrolling in a Lucentis clinical trial. And when she left the Lucentis clinical trial in her better eye, she was 2040 in 2006. And when she died, uh, 18 years after diagnosis, she was 2060. So she she maintained vision to the level of 2060 after almost 20 years of injections in her um, second eye with macular degeneration. So yes, uh, patients can do well long term. There's no reason to stop. These are very effective therapies. I know it gets old. I know it gets um, challenging for you, for the patients and their families. 
but it works and it really you, you really need to stick to it. Oh, that's a wonderful case study there. That's um, that's great. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and this can be relatively quick um, if we can make it quick. Um, we have a lot of people who um, have sensitivity to betadine, and they're just asking the names of the other products or the other um, ways the doctor can sanitize and clean the eye before the injection, if that's a quick answer. I, I do realize we're running out of time, too. Yeah, it's a quick answer. Pisahex is a skin cleaner that's used in surgery as well. It doesn't work quite as well as betadine, but it's certainly not a bad option. And then the final option is if you can't tolerate betadine at all, and you're and 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 that's not available, there are there there is some rationale to just use um, antibiotic topical antibiotic drops prior to an injection. Um, you know, it's the, the by far the most effective way to get the safest injection is with betadine, but we all recognize that betadine can be pretty irritating. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Um, and we'll have that in the transcript for um, for those who are asking that. And I think this is a simple yes or no. I'll ask one more. Can you get injections um, in both eyes on the same day using ILEA or whatever the anti-VEGF um, uh, injection that they're getting is? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Um, no, this has been wonderful. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here. Um, I sincerely hope that everybody found today's chat helpful. Um, I certainly learned some, and um, thank you so much for your, um, for your time today. Um, this has just been outstanding, Dr. Clark. I'm, I'm so grateful that you joined us today. Um, do you have any final remarks or tips you'd like to share with the audience before we conclude for the day? Uh, no, none other than thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. This is wonderful. We look forward to the transcript. We'll share that with you as well as everybody else on the call. Um, thank you, everybody, again for joining us today, and this concludes the Bright Focus Macular Chat. Have a wonderful day. The information provided in this recording is a public service of Bright Focus Foundation and is not intended to constitute medical advice. Please consult your physician for personalized medical, dietary, and or exercise advice. Any medications or supplements should only be taken under medical supervision. Bright Focus Foundation does not endorse any medical products or therapies.